A reading from Mark's Gospel, the third chapter, verses 20 through 35. Listen for God's word. The crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables, saying, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came. And standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was an intervention staged by his family, plain and simple. Oh, I get it. They wouldn't have called it that. That idea wasn't around in those days. They would have said, uh, we're, we're just looking out for him. <laughs> uh, you, you have to excuse him. You see, Jesus, is, is, he's just not himself right now, you see. They would have told him, come on, Jesus, come with us. It's going to be okay. Let's just go back home. Let's calm down. Get out of this crowd. That's what they would have said. But make no mistake, his family was staging an intervention. And really, it's no wonder. I mean, think about what Jesus had been doing. Think about the things he had been saying. Jesus is going around performing miracles like cleansing lepers and restoring withered hands. Jesus is saying things like, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Or, your sins are forgiven. Or, hey disciples, I'm giving you authority to cast out people's demons. Let me ask you this. What would you do if one of your loved ones was running around talking like this? What would you do if they were saying these kind of things? What would you think? Now, Jesus was drawing an uncomfortable amount of attention to himself. People were talking about him. People were wondering about him. People were worried about him. And somewhere, somebody had to ask the question, has this guy lost it? Is this guy crazy? Now, I realize that word crazy is a very loaded term. It's not what It's not a term that we would use today regarding people with mental illness. But if we are honest, it is what a lot of us think. That's the term that does float around in our minds. And I'm willing to bet that that's probably what Jesus' friends and family were thinking about him as well. 
So while I want to be careful with that term today, I hope you will bear with me and perhaps we can redeem it a little bit by the end. So in verse 21, we see Jesus' loved ones staging what amounts to a failed intervention. Mark tells us they went out to restrain him. That's what his family was doing. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. Then, to make matters even worse, in verse 22, the religious authorities have noticed, and their assessment is even worse. They think he is possessed by the Beelzebul. Now, today... We have the benefit of hindsight and faith so that we can understand that Jesus was not crazy or possessed, but is, in fact, God in the flesh. However, we must admit that their speculation isn't really entirely off the rails, is it? What else must brothers and sisters who for 30 years have known a normal Jesus, what must they assume at this point? What other conclusion could the scholarly religious authorities in that day come to? Sane and non-possessed people don't turn their lives into a public spiritual show. They don't make claims to deity. They don't publicly discuss demons. That's not normal. Not then and not now. But you know what? Sometimes crazy and genius look a lot alike. Such is the case with Jesus. It's not that he's mad. No, It's that his world, in other words, his kingdom, and he as its leader are so otherworldly that it surprises us. And it shakes our foundations. Humanity had never seen such power on public display. It had never heard these kind of values being taught. It had never witnessed such a dynamic and divine authority wrapped in so much weakness. He was basically a homeless, self-made rabbi from Nazareth with, as Isaiah reminds us, no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. it's really likely that we would have called him mad as well. Jesus, for his part, does not seem overly bothered by the accusations of insanity. Instead, Jesus takes the response of those concerned and uses it to illustrate a dividing line between faith and disbelief. Those who will be forgiven are those who can see that behind the jaw-dropping miracles, an alarming message is the very Spirit of God. A truth worth remembering is that the kingdom of God, the work of the Spirit, when on the move, will always disrupt and disturb a so-called sane world. If craziness is persistently violating social norms with little regard for oneself, then the work of Jesus fits the description. For example, the world idolizes logic and reason. But God's people live by faith and embrace mystery. The world abuses the weak and tries to fix the poor. God's people embrace the lowly as the greatest among us. The world rewards the strongest and the most capable. God's people openly confess our struggles and repent of our sins. 
The world says it's okay to hate those who have hurt you. God's people say we love our enemies and we pray for those who persecute us. The world is full of people scrambling to stock up as much earthly treasure as they possibly can before they die. God's people seek to give it away in favor of treasure in heaven. The world's motto is love yourself and try not to hurt your neighbor. Our motto is love your neighbor and in doing so be willing to sacrifice yourself. So if Christians are called crazy from time to time, well, as Jesus might have put it, welcome to my world. Here's the deal. If God is real, then by definition, God is above and beyond any and all cultures, perspectives, and political views. No one tribe completely gets God. Therefore, in some way, as God breaks into our world through the Son, the Word and Spirit-filled people, God will, in some way, offend and jar the sensibilities of everyone at some time or another. If the God we worship is not deeply disrupting and uncomfortably confronting some part of our lives, then the God we worship is likely one of our own creation and not the one of the Bible. Nowhere is this illustrated more vividly than in Jesus himself. For example, Take the incarnation. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. We say Jesus is fully human and fully divine. But that doesn't make any sense. 2 Corinthians says, For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you may become rich. Does that make sense? Or how about Philippians? Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death. On a cross. What kind of God does this? Or take the cross. First Corinthians says, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God in flesh, in other words, giving his life as a gift for a rebellious and evil humanity is flat out crazy. It's pure foolishness. Or how about salvation? Most religious systems require that the one being rescued do something. You have to grow in certain knowledge or demonstrate a certain obedience. But we are told that Christ died for us while we were still sinners and made us alive when we were dead. Ephesians tells us that we bring nothing to the table. Instead, God, by God's Spirit, brings us to the table and feeds us an unrelenting course of mercy and grace. This runs counter to all that we celebrate in the world, all that the world tells us is true. It's not how countries are conquered, how championships are won, or how a heart is wooed. It is, to the human hearer, completely ludicrous. And yet it's true. 
It's true. Or how about the resurrection? We just had Easter a few weeks ago. Dead men walking. Right? Enough said. When these ludicrous truths lay hold of you, it changes you, or at least it should change you. That is, if you haven't held it back and been sold some lie about a safe and sound Christianity. Look at the first century church. We talked about them a little bit on Pentecost. How this little tiny group of people suddenly went out there and started, started preaching like, they, they, like their lives depended on it, which maybe it did. Look at the book of Acts, where, how people responded to this. Where with dumbfounded and wide-eyed wonder, the world responds to the early believers. People were saying things like this about Christians. Look at them. They share their stuff with each other and with the world. They celebrate in their struggles. They eat flesh and drink blood. We can't hate them. They're insane. Look at church history. There we find countless examples of people who confronted the culture and paid the ultimate price. What would happen if the church today embraced its craziness? What if rather than worry about fitting in and being relevant, <coughs> the church chose to bear hug her weirdness? Everybody has that one person they know. A cousin, a brother, a sister, a neighbor, who just doesn't care what anybody else thinks. Who marches to the beat of a different drummer. Who does their thing. Who is completely different. Completely different from the world around them. What if the church was that person? What would the church look like? Would the church be less put off when the homeless woman wanders in on a Sunday morning and instead give her a seat of honor and afford her great dignity? Would the church encourage radical generosity among the people? You know, the kind of generosity that makes people start to talk about you behind your back. Would the church start ministries that do more than entertain and educate, but that pursue the people the world rejects and not be worried about what that might do to our reputation? Would the church preach the frightening depths of God's demand upon humanity for righteousness and purity, yet counter it with a jaw-dropping and offensive amount of grace afforded to us in Jesus? In our text today, Jesus' friends and family were wondering if he was crazy. But we must ask, are we crazy enough? The answer will probably be no. Well, then let us, set, let us be set free with the insane message of the gospel. Christ has been crucified to cover our lack of crazy. And let us then go out the door with the reminder that we have been set free as agents of an upside down and insane world known as the kingdom of God. Oh, I know, I know. There are those 
There are those who will take offense at the whole notion of being crazy for Jesus. But me, I think that's good news. Crazy good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.